we are very excited to, to welcome Dr. Heather Willis Allen, who is an associate professor in the Department of French and Italian at the University of Wisconsin Madison, where she's also a member of the SLA PhD program, and she also serves as the language program director in French. She's busy. Uh, <laughs> well, we actually don't have a language program director. Oh, well, um, emphatically, you. I'm a course chair. Okay. So. Course chair for first and second year, though, right? First three semesters. First three semesters. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, then, yeah. Close enough. Close <laughs> enough. Thanks, Mandy. That was such a nice introduction, and thank you all for being here um, today. Um, I want to thank Carla for their support of this talk, and also to the language departments who co-sponsored this event, which are Spanish and Portuguese studies, and also German, Nordic, Slavic, and Dutch. Today I'm going to be talking, as you see from the first slide here, about the role of writing instruction in collegiate foreign language programs. And this presentation has two parts. So the first is data-based, and I'm going to be sharing some preliminary findings from a qualitative study that I'm currently working on. Um, and then in the second part of the presentation, I will argue in favor of an integrated post-process approach to writing instruction that can really be applied in any language, literature, or cultural studies course um, in the undergraduate language curriculum. So I'm going to start with a quote from the 2009 Modern Language Association um, report. Oh, am I not? Let me get something on screen that I'm not happy about. Oh, this, yes. <laughs> Better? So it's not recording, but that's all right. Okay. You've got it back there. Perfect. All right. Better? Okay. So let's get this started again. I'm also getting to know this mouse, so bear with me. <laughs> um, Lauren understands what that means. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm so I'm going to start with a quote from the 2009 Modern Language Association report on the state of the undergraduate language major. Um, there was a working group uh, about a decade ago of leaders in English and modern foreign language education who crafted this report and they stated, speaking, reading and writing have traditionally stood at the heart of education because the arts of language and the tools of literacy are key qualifications for full participation in social, political, economic, and cultural life. Today, the hallmarks of a liberal arts education, communication, critical analysis, and creativity are more important than ever as prerequisites for success in life. Intrinsically linked, 
reading and writing are not natural or instinctive skills, but skills contingent on a lengthy learning process in which students practice reading and writing as an interrelated complementary pair. So, although most likely we would agree with these sentiments on the value and transferable nature of reading and writing in a foreign language, recent research calls into question the priority placed on teaching and learning foreign language writing at the collegiate level. So in total, four studies have been conducted in the past decade that have investigated learners and instructors' view of various areas of language study. Magnan and her colleagues' work found that student perceptions of presentational communication placed it lower in comparison to all the other goal areas of the national standards. Um, Next, there's a group of studies, several of them, that looked at the value, the perceived value of um, written presentational communication in particular. And it was ranked in the actual study that I reference here by, by instructors as having lower priority than other communicative modes. And then the study by Mills and Multan, which looked at student rankings of perceived values, placed written presentational communication lowest among 10 different goal areas of language and cultural study. Um, lastly, in a study by Lefkowitz that was based on interviews with uh, collegiate foreign language instructors in a range of more commonly and less commonly taught languages, her participants who are collegiate instructors called writing students' weakest skill area. So let's take a moment now to look at findings from the small number of studies that have been conducted on the use of different writing pedagogies in the US collegiate context. So these can be grouped into three different categories. Um, the first are, are the, the studies that have looked at process-based writing. So this is an approach that most of us are probably familiar with, focusing on the cognitive elements of writing, how to carry out a writing task, the generation of learners' ideas and creativity, and tends to focus on form and the editing phase of text creation. So what has research on this approach showed? Well, that the use of multiple drafts and varied forms of feedback is widespread um, among collegiate instructors. However, techniques such as pre-writing, in-class writing, and peer review seem to have a more limited uptake. Um, and lastly, that a preoccupation seems to persist with grammatical accuracy and error correction over other elements of writing. Um, there, there are also some articles that look at the role of genre pedagogies in the collegiate curriculum. Those studies have not focused to date on the instructor side of writing, but instead have shown that genre pedagogies are effective for writing development and the exploration of cultural content and different perspectives in the foreign or second language. Heidi Burns and her colleagues have demonstrated how a genre and multiliteracies oriented learning trajectory can anchor different levels of the curriculum. Lastly, there's a group of articles that have looked at instructor professional development and knowledge of best practices in writing instruction. And these, um, these studies have shown that both professional development and working knowledge that can inform writing instruct instruction are an ongoing challenge. Um, I'm going to, sh to quote Hubert and his colleague Bonzo in conclusions from their 2019 study. Um, and here is the quote. Um, and in this conclusion, their study, the, they conducted the study a couple years ago. It just came out in the past month or two. But some of the main takeaways are that knowledge continues to be, as they say, largely absence, absent from the awareness of the foreign language collegiate community. 
Um, there, the, again, this focus on grammatical correctness is seen, and, and their study was actually based on 10 participants in different foreign languages. They were the first study um, to not only look at survey data, most of these studies have been based on survey data, but they also looked at instructional artifacts, at syllabi, at writing workshop information, and they conducted some limited follow-up interviews as well. Um, so they were looking at not only what people say about what they do in the classroom, but um, what they actually do. And I, I forgot to mention they, they also conducted observations with those 10 participants. Um, one of the conclusions that they arrived at, as you see in the last um, bolded section, is that in first and second year language uh, courses, as they stated, novice and intermediate writers most often do not actually learn to write in their courses. On the other hand, it's more that writing is used as a springboard um, to focus on other modalities and in particular speaking. So, um, reading this, these studies, um, writing a, a position paper in the spring of 2018 while I was on sabbatical really left me curious about collegiate writing instruction. Um, the portrait that emerges from reading this, these um, studies is, is a rather um, negative one, <laughs> I would say. Um, it, it leaves a lot of questions, so I wanted to conduct my own study and try to build on some of the research and maybe expand um, in my methodology and perhaps improve. Um, so I conducted a study and I looked at two primary research questions questions. How are instructors conceptualizing, teaching, and assessing writing? Um, and what affordances and constraints influence these conceptualizations as well as instructional practices? So it seemed that today people were focusing on what is happening, what theories are known, what practices are used, but I also wanted to tap into the why. Um, if people aren't uh, carrying out best practices, what types of contextual variables and individual variables inform that and perhaps constrain? And I thought that that would be a helpful jumping off point to being able to articulate different or better practices. Um, the theoretical framework that I use for this study is activity theory. Um, I'm going to try to summarize a very complex theory in a few lines. Activity theory posits a link between internal and external factors as critical to understanding how people think and behave. This framework, this framework helps make sense of how activity unfolds by analyzing multiple elements, such as instructors' motives and goals, histories and ideologies, use of instructional tools, actions and interactions, power, status, roles, rules. So there's all kinds of variables that are examined um, and that inform what instructors do and how they do it. So that's a little bit about the background of the theory that I was bringing to the research design of this study. So data collection um, occurred from summer 2018 through early spring 2019. I wanted to seek out a diverse group of participants in terms of where these instructors were teaching, their <coughs> demographic um, characteristics, and um, the types of contexts that they are working in. The data, I, the data I will be sharing today is part of a larger participant pool that contains both high school and collegiate level French instructors. There are 26 in total in my larger sample and I'll be sharing data um, in relation to the 18 who are teaching at the collegiate level. I had two recruitment sites for my study. One was at the 2018 Advanced Placement French Exam Reading. So this is the site where in the summer, um, 
educators gather and are basically locked into a convention center um, for a week to grade exams. And I thought, wow, this would be a wonderful place to locate research um, participants and entice them into um, participating in my study. Um, and the other site that I recruited at that also had an interesting and diverse sample was the summer program where I teach in Angers, France. It's through the University of Southern Oregon and and teachers from all around the US as well as other countries are working there toward a master's degree in French language teaching and in that site I was able to recruit both the faculty of the program as well as the high school teachers who are working toward their MA degrees so I had these um, these two recruitment sites and here's a little bit of information about my participant pool um, these were all, and this should be noted, experienced instructors. On average, I didn't really even um, note that at, at the time, within the subpool of the collegiate instructors, on average, they had 21 years of teaching experience. So these are really, really seasoned teachers. Five men, 13 women, which is pretty typical, I think, in French, that it skews um, female. And a range of backgrounds. Um, the majority of participants were English speakers from the United States, and there was seven French um, native speakers, one Haitian Creole, and one one Polish speaker. Um, it should be noted that all of the participants um, completed their graduate studies in the United States. And you can see the list of their spe specialization. The majority were um, literature um, faculty, liter literature and cultural studies faculty, with six in linguistics or second language acquisition or foreign language education. Um, the crowning technological achievement of the, of the presentation is about to occur. Um, this is, <laughs> I was pretty excited. Um, so this is a map of, of where my participants were from. And these states pictured in yellow show where there were public college or university participants, blue for public one public, one private participants, and green where we had a private college participant. So they come from a range of places, and these, um, these sites where I recruited were what enabled me to have this kind of interesting geographic mix that's um, often not possible. So I had three data sources for the study, a survey, an interview, which in terms of the, the results that I'll be presenting to you was the most important um, data source. The interviews ranged from 35 minutes to one hour and 35 minutes in length. Um, on average, the, the interviews were about 55 minutes. People like to talk about themselves and their trajectories and what they do as teachers. Um, these were transcribed verbatim and I have coded them using Max QDA analysis software. Um, I'm still at the preliminary findings phase, so I haven't had these double coded yet, but before I get to the more formal um, dissemination of this research, there is yet another level of coding that will occur. Um, 14 of the 18 participants also submitted to me some information to give me a better idea beyond what they said they did of what types of materials they're using in class. So that was syllabi, writing rubrics, writing assignments, and things like that. So now let's go on to the findings. And you have a handout. Hopefully everyone has a handout. And I probably won't be doing a lot of reading of the data findings from the handout. But I would encourage you to follow along. And each of the subcategories of the findings on the handout um, corresponds to one of the slides that you will see shortly. Um, so the first thing I wanted to start with was the participants' conceptualizations and associations with writing. So one of my interview questions was, what are your associations with foreign language writing? How would you finish this sentence for me? For me, foreign teaching my students to write is. So um, what you see in this slide is a synthesis of the most common themes, the most commonly um, cited uh, association 
with writing is that it is a process. And you see that in Jack's quote on the first page of the handout. It's a long process. It requires patience, writing, rewriting, rethinking, re-editing, right? So this gets at it's longitudinal. It's a joint process um, between me and the students, the students and their texts. Um, we also had some participants who said in a more kind of neutral register that it was challenging. This is really hard to do well, um, as well as um, participants who had more negative primary associations with teaching writing, saying it's painful, it's difficult. You can see this in, um, in Brad's comments, right? He says, tedious, time consuming. I have a lot of adjectives, none of them positive. Um, and he was very focused on the time involved in teaching writing well and in assessing writing. Um, one surprise to me when I conducted the interviews was that three of the participants clarified immediately for me, I do not teach writing. And you can see this in the response um, under 1A from Kelly. I teach them grammar, but for writing, I just have them do it. And then I underline errors and have them correct it. So three out of the 18 participants had um, similar responses that they, they do not include explicit writing instruction in their courses. Next, the, pedical, the pedagogical approaches to teaching writing that were, um, that w the participants claimed they use. And I say claim to use because in the survey, um, I, I adapted Hubert and Bonzo's um, survey questions where I listed and defined approaches to writing. So um, 16 of the participants either um, clicked in their survey on I use process writing approaches or genre based writing approaches. Um, I will say that for most of the participants who claim to, to use process writing approaches in their survey, they also explained and elaborated on those techniques. Um, and I'll get into a little more detail about those in a moment. Um, less commonly cited was genre based techniques. Um, and many of those who cited using genre techniques, I would say, um, and here I'm also picking up on the language of Hubert and Bonzo, that it indirectly informed their work. On page one, you could see in the comments from Ryan, um, he said, on one hand, it's not really theory driven for me, but I kind of tried to dig a little deeper and I said, well, you said that you do genre based writing in your survey. Can you tell me about it? And he really associated it with the textbooks that he was using in his different writing classes and said, oh, I'm, I have these materials. They use this approach. Therefore, I use that approach. But he was not um, directly explaining theoretically driven practices. Um, seven different participants during the interviews made comments um, along the lines of I have difficulty identifying or explaining vis-a-vis -vis a particular theory or approach what I'm doing with writing instruction. Um, in terms of the instructional practices, particularly among the proponents of process writing, Pre-writing activities were widely practiced. The most commonly for used forms were outlines or brainstorms. Um, a few participants indicated reading to write activities using model texts and pre-writing. Um, Looking at the instructional materials, it was clear that writing played a very minor role in beginning or 100 level courses. On average, writing accounted for 5% of a final um, course grade in intermediate courses, accounting for 15% of final course grades, and in advanced undergraduate courses, 35% of final course grades. All participants claim to have the freedom to teach writing using the approach and practices of their choice, and in no cases were um, approaches to teaching writing programmatically, um, pro programmatically mandated. Um, I also wanted to point out, and this is on page two of your handout, 
11 of the participants, when I asked them to talk to me a little bit about where writing fit in and kind of a hierarchy of instructional priorities vis-a-vis -vis the other linguistic modalities, 11 of them were explicit and were clear that writing um, fell out lower than the other linguistic modalities of speaking, um, reading, or um, listening, viewing. One thing that um, we might see as concerning in the findings is at the top, top and middle of page two, um, several of the participants mentioned that it falls on the wayside, as Severine mentioned, in lower level classes, whereas um, at the same time you had people who, like Kelly who said, in the advanced classes, I never give class time. The assumption is they're basically equipped to write. So it begs the question um, where the writing development is happening in some classrooms if it's deprioritized and it falls by the wayside in the lower level classes, but there might be an expectation that students know how to write and have gained um, effective writing strategies when they get to those upper level culture and um, literature courses. In terms of assessment practices, um, the majority of participants were using correction codes as a, t a feedback tool. Um, they were using rubrics as an evaluation tool, but I think a footnote is also needed there because several of my participants who talked about using rubrics also um, mentioned that they found the use of rubrics e either specifically or in general to be problematic. Um, in one case, Brad said, a colleague at the AP reading asked me if I had a rubric I use, and I said no, so I immediately felt inadequate. And she said, oh, I can share some with you. So um, it's kind of, I, I got the idea that people felt like they should use rubrics, but in three or four cases, they said, well, I have a rubric, but I grade holistically. I know what an A looks like, and you can see that in some of the comments um, here on page two. Maybe Margot, I'm pre-rubric. I'm from pre-rubric. So, um, lastly, affordances and constraints. What is helping people learn to, to teach writing better and what is constraining um, robust, effective writing practices? Nine participants mentioned meaningful professional development experiences related to writing. But what was interesting is that only two of these were professional development experiences specifically related to foreign language writing. The most frequently referenced affordances were on-campus writing centers and teaching writing intensive courses in English. So um, in some cases, there was a participant, participant, for example, Diana, who took part in a writing retreat to help her own academic writing, her professional writing. And she said that she got a lot of good strategies for that, even though her retreat was on her L1 writing and her professional writing that she subsequently mapped onto um, some of her third, third year French culture courses. Constraints to writing, this probably comes as no surprise to any of you, time was far and away um, the top response there, particularly in terms of evaluation and giving meaningful feedback to students. Um, seven part participants explicitly said, I just didn't have enough training. I wish I would have had more professional development. This really holds me back in the way that I teach writing. Um, then self-beliefs, and I put this, this, um, I put this a little farther down, I would say, in terms of a constraint, because this is an association that I'm making, and I'm doing this kind of through the lens of activity theory. Um, one or two participants did make that explicit um, connection that my self-beliefs are constraining um, what I'm doing in the classroom. One of those was Renee. Um, I don't know if, yes, so you do see that there. I'm pretty neurotic about my writing in French. I'm getting better, but I'm sure that to some extent, unconsciously, my students acquire my, no, my own anxieties, right? Um, a response that we had from participants not only who are non-native speakers of French, but also native speakers, was that they do not have enough 
opportunities in their current professional life to write in French. Um, a, frequent, um, a frequently mentioned type of writing was emails. Oh, I do a lot of emails, short emails in French, but beyond that I get kind of nervous. Sometimes I use Google, right? Um, so they mentioned this, that that, that, that is a, a quality that, that they are holding in their mind as they are evaluating student writing. So I thought that was interesting, um, that self-beliefs do appear to have some level of influence on what's happening in the classroom. So to synthesize these findings, um, these instructors conceptualized, taught, and assessed writing in really highly individualized ways. These ways were mediated by both first language and second language writing experiences, beliefs about writing instruction, professional development, and priorities for student learning. Um, I did see some good evidence of process techniques, but little evidence of robust or direct knowledge of other approaches beyond process writing. Most of the instructional focus in the classroom, in terms of what my participants said and what their instructional documents suggested, was that they are focusing on cognitive and linguistic aspects of writing and instruction. So organizing how the writing process plays out, thinking about the linguistic resources needed to create texts, but there was no evidence of significant effort, particularly in first and second year language courses, on teaching genre-specific conventions, um, communication of meaningful ideas, or on writing in a variety of genres. And I reached this conclusion based on um, some of the questions that I asked about the types of texts that were being used in first and second year classes. It was often, oh, it's short paragraphs, or um, it's an essay. Um, rare were the participants that told me about specific genres of texts that were being produced. So where do we need to go in terms of writing instructional strategies in our context? Well, I think we need to take into account the knowledge base about best practices grounded in L1 and L2 writing contexts from English, ESL, EFL, and try to align writing strategies, writing instructional strategies, with the notion of writing as a multi-dimensional communicative act. This idea um, is captured in um, Highland's list of the different types of knowledge that are necessary to write well in another language. So one thing that makes providing good writing instruction so challenging is the existence of these different types of knowledge. It's not just about finding the right words or the right forms, punctuation and spelling, which is of course system knowledge. It's also about knowing how to approach the writing task, so having an effective process, also having good and interesting ideas, and possessing awareness of your audience or your reader, and the conventions that inform how a text is constructed. So what sort of pedagogical approach or approaches could be most appropriate for use in undergraduate courses and curricula? My proposal follows the same arguments of L2 writing scholars like Highland and Rasslis and Matsuda who urge researchers and practitioners to think beyond a single formula for teaching or a single theoretical perspective, and Rick Kern who called for an integrated student-centered approach to teaching writing that takes into account the multi-dimensional nature of this communicative act. So I'm going to move into the last part of the talk now, while, and I will describe my proposal, which I should mention is not a new approach to teaching writing. It's a combination of tenets from several complementary orientations to language learning and writing, and takes into account the unique context that we have in collegiate foreign language programs. This orientation, what I call a design approach, integrates concepts from multiliteracies pedagogy and second language writing research. Whereas meaning design has been widely discussed as the central preoccupation of multiliteracies pedagogy, to date, design has not been posited as the framing concept for writing instruction in another language. 
This approach posits writing as a purposeful, collaborative act of communication with linguistic, cognitive, and sociocultural dimensions, each of which should be addressed in the course of instruction. So in this regard, a design approach does not focus solely on the learner's individual writing process, nor does it privilege only the textual or sociocultural aspects of writing while leaving the cognitive aspects of writing by the wayside. Um, so a definition of the notion of design that you see here, developing literacy in a new language does not occur through skill practice, but through engagement in literacy events in which learners design new meanings. This might take the form of reading, viewing, speaking, or writing discourse or texts. This meaning design is dual entailing both the process or creation and interpretation of texts and the product or content form and organization that characterize texts. My proposal anchored in the concept of design focuses on five elements which can be incorporated in writing instruction. First, a focus on available designs. Collegiate foreign language writing instruction, as we've seen today, has long privileged grammatical accuracy over other textual elements or aspects of the writing process. A situation Lefkowitz stated potentially interferes with sociolinguistic sensitivity, realistic expectations, and professional enjoyment by both students and instructors. In a design approach, the resources needed to create texts are viewed as multifaceted, including linguistic, schematic, visual, and spatial elements. Next, reading to write activities can be used before asking learners to produce texts to sensitize them through analysis of model text to appropriate the use of available designs relevant to specific textual genres. These activities can be a useful way to reduce anxiety and cognitive overload associated with writing in a foreign language. So many of us are um, familiar with that dynamic wherein learners become overloaded linguistically and cogn cognitively, and this leads to the ineffective use of tools like Google Translate. Um, I should also mention that reading to write activities, as you can see in the example near the end of the handout, are activities that are done in class. So writing is a social and collaborative process. So that pre-writing process is happening together with classmates, together with an instructor, rather than at home where the student is starting with a blank screen, getting overwhelmed, and going to the translation tools. The third element of a design approach is multimodality, or aligning writing to recommendations like those of the National Council of Teachers of English to, and here I quote their association, to support students as they compose with a variety of modalities and technologies, including the incorporation of visual components and hyperlinks. A focus on multimodality can take many directions, as straightforward as analyzing how formatting conventions and visuals contribute to a text's overall meaning, or it can be as creative as a textual transformation activity um, where students are taking a text in one modality and creating a new one. Multimodality is another element that helps learners to see effective writing is not limited to just finding the right words or grammatically correct structures. Instead, it results from weaving together appropriate and interesting linguistic and non-linguistic available designs in texts. Perspective taking, the fourth design element, relates to the particular advantage of writing in comparison to many other forms of oral language, which Kern described as allowing learners' language use to go beyond functional communication making it possible to create imagined worlds of their own design. Whereas writing in lower level language courses tends to be learner oriented, so describe your daily routine, recount a memorable vacation, by incorporating perspective taking in writing and shifting learners' point of view, um, from the start, awareness can be gained of new language, culture, and context specific meanings. 
Um, and here I'm picking up on the work of Erin Carney, if any of you are familiar with her work on um, interculturality and perspective taking. And learners are, are allowed to play with new available designs and participate in creative invention and trying on new identities. Although perspective taken has been taken up primarily by researchers and related to project-based learning and global simulation, its potential to inform writing instruction should be further explored. Perspective taking could prove to be a valuable way to increase learner motivation and engagement with writing. The final component of design writing is collaboration or facilitating a writing cycle in which social interaction, both between learner and instructor, and among learners facilitates the development of a writing community. This can take various forms, including pre-writing activities, individual writing conferences, peer feedback, text read-alouds, and self-reflections. All these activities reinforce the dialogical or social nature of writing and represent a possible way of positively influencing learners' concerns and um, their valuing or non-valuing of writing. So um, I already mentioned that there is an instructional example on the handout if you're curious about how this could play out. And that example is from a first year French language course. These components can be engaged in different ways. I wanna mention that this is not a recipe and um, all five of these design elements do not need to be engaged in all forms of writing. Um, depending on the nature of the course, the writing, and the time available for writing instruction. Some types of writing will not involve all five design elements or, or may focus more heavily on one component while minimizing another. I should mention in the first level language courses that I supervise and on occasion teach, we only use all five of these elements um, in our formal presentational writing projects twice per semester although we use several of these components on a more recurrent basis in relation to informal interpersonal writing. So we do about nine or 10 of those um, per term. I've also used this course in cultural studies. I mean, these components I should mention in cultural studies and writing courses, and, and they're very um, useful in those contexts. Um, so I want to end by mentioning some feasibility considerations to think about in relation to design instruction. So there's different types of considerations that um, need to be taken into account when considering adapting um, or exploring new pedagogies like this. Um, we started in my program in the first semester with using these techniques for formal presentational um, writing assignments, and then we developed them for the second semester. This year we've moved to third semester. Um, we're doing some multimodal writing in the second year now using these design concepts. But um, it is clear also through some research that I've engaged in um, with Kate and um, from the work that Lauren Goodsby did in her dissertation that instructors do need to have professional development to understand the conceptual underpinnings of design pedagogy, not only to read about it, but discuss it, try it out, revise materials, um, but clearly it works best as a collaborative effort. Um, and then the work that Lauren did in her dissertation, we've also found out through that and our recent qualitative study on instructor practices that not just in instructors, but students themselves have powerful beliefs about writing, about plagiarism, and about the use of tools like dictionaries. And these should be taken into consideration. Um, and they also help explain why students may be resisting or questioning instructional practices. Um, and I'm going to conclude here with an excerpt from the quote that I started with from that 2009 MLA report. Again, reading and writing are not natural or instinctive skills, but skills contingent on a lengthy learning process in which students practice reading and writing as an interrelated complementary pair. These are ideas that resonate strongly with me, and I hope that I've given you some new food for thought today on how you might approach writing instruction using design pedagogy. Thank you.
Hi. <laughs> Yes. So I wonder if that even comes as an importance for them. Right. Because there, there's all these issues of plagiarism and ownership, and not, I saw on your slide that some instructors don't allow their students to use Absolutely. Like, yes. It did. I, there were a couple of, in terms of an affordance for student writing. Yes, and it did. Um, so I, there were two participants that talked in detail about how they teach responsible use of the tools. There were a couple more that just kind of set it as an aside. Um, but that tended to be associated, unsurprisingly, with teachers with a more robust um, uh, arsenal of writing strategies. And they seem to have that belief that what, whether we forbid it or not, the use is going on, you might as well make it an explicit part of the pre-writing process. Yeah, yeah, so that did come out for, a, for just a couple of participants, so, yeah. Right, those were not the people who were yeah. that mentioned. Yeah, Betsy. You use uh, the expression available design and then in caps. Could you just give a little uh, brief us on what that means? <laughs> yeah, so available designs are resources that either relate to the first language or the language that a student is um, learning. Um, I would say that the closest sentence in them is resources, and, and the adjective that would go before research resources would be it can be linguistic, right? So. It can be vocabulary, it can be grammar, but it can also be schematic or generic. So it could be cultural s stories, um, so it could be knowledge, it could be knowing how a cover letter is formatted in the US versus in France. So that's an available design. It's kind of all the different tools in your suitcase, so to speak, that go into helping you to make meaning in a new language or to comprehend and analyze the meaning in that language, right? So it's kind of a broadening from the notion that it's all about focus on form, right? That it goes beyond the linguistic. Um, and meaning resources, that, that would be? That's a synonym, mm -hmm. Re meaning uh, resources. And at one point you referred to linguistic, thematic, visual, and facial aspects. Visual? Oh, that's a typo of, I don't, I don't I, 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 That's what I thought Visual, I heard. Visual, schematic. Maybe spatial? Spatial. spatial. Oh, spatial. spatial. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be like formatting conventions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Although some of us make meaning with our faces. Of course, it's a concept of face. It was like too. Thank you. So, I wonder if in, in, the, in your informants anybody brought up um, actual guidelines as far as writing is concerned. Yes. So the two um, participants who, in terms of the affordances, that's a great, you click too much, sorry. So in the professional development experiences, um, the, there were um, two participants who had participated in actual OPI training. I have this on my little field. Um, and what they said was they found that extremely valuable in mapping their new conceptual understandings of the OPI to performance standards for writing. But there were not actual workshops. Only one person had taken an actual workshop related to the writing guidelines. But no mention of, of the can-do statements or? None. Just the OPI and one writing proficiency workshop. But I wonder if you, you've just looked at the collegiate data. I wonder if that'll differ yes. when you look yeah. at the high school teacher data. I think so. I do think so because remember, on average, these are literature faculty, two-thirds of them literature faculty with a mean experience average of 21 years. Mm -hmm. So they went through
graduate school at the time that the national standards were just getting started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I really like what you said about instructors writing in the language they're teaching in, because sometimes the students think, well, you don't have to write this, and sometimes I want to show them an article that I've written in French or a book review, and I, you know, I talk about, like, oh, I had to do this 500 words, and I have to say I wrote this, like, eight times because I write too much and I do right. 500 words. And then the thing I was talking to Lauren about that I did recently, they had to write a paragraph on their vacation. So this time I gave them a sample and I said, I tried to write this like you in intermediate French. I didn't write this like, you know, middle-aged woman talking about it. And I talked about what I did with my son. And it was really helpful to them because it was like, this is the voice that I'm using mm. to talk about my vacation, but it's not the same voice I'm sure. using to write this book review. Because sometimes I get the feeling the students think like, well, you don't have to write this essay. So you don't feel my pain. So so it's like sometimes it's nice to to tell them, well, I do write in the foreign language and like, you know, I try to write my emails, like I'll write a big like if I have a French correspondent, write a big long thing in French. So you have to kind of convey to them that you are doing it yourself. Right. right. And Especially like, if you're, you know, a citizen of the United States or whatever. You know. Yeah, and I like how you mentioned you, there's a certain voice. It's right. not it's not just, oh, I put on my best vocab and grammar, and this text is effective and interesting. Right. That's one thing that I think is interesting in design pedagogy is in our pre-writing, even with first-year students, we're doing things like you see in the example. Okay, this is a blog post, you know, this online writing about, you know, where to live in your hometown. Mm -hmm. um, it, you have to go further than finding the right vocabulary and grammar to write about your hometown. We kind of, we kind of focused on this idea of, argument versus description. A good blog post isn't just going to describe, it's going to convey opinions and um, how the person relates to place, right? Um, but that idea of voice is so important. Mm -hmm. well, couldn't you also say that, that a genre-based approach or a design approach kind of creates a level layer of authenticity that isn't always present in the sorts of more traditional prompts that we give our students? So that then they see, oh well, I would write this. I, I would write a blog post, or mm -hmm. I would. Um, I'm trying to think of something that's more authentic, but like an invitation to a party or mm -hmm. something like that, like an e-bite. Like those are things that students would do that we would we do too as users of the language. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I've, I've sort of landed on just to tag onto what Kate just said. The, the notion of design and genre as a sub-concept of design because I think that genre-based approaches have tended to underplay the cognitive part, the, the, the interaction part of the process, um, and you know, the criticism of genre-based approaches is that it can be sort of like recipe writing or, you know, here's the model, just churn out a new one. Um, Lauren could <laughs> tell us all about that from her work. Um, but I, for me, design really resonates as an integrated approach, right? So genre plus some other things added on, despite my discomfort with the fact that it's somewhat eclectic. I'm still looking that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more. I mean, you mentioned that the average uh, amount of experience is 20 plus years out of the, was it 24 participants? Um, did you notice any different, well, I mean, I guess, how big a range was there? Mm -hmm. um, apart so from the, the least experience was seven years. <laughs> okay. Um, and it went up to 29. Okay, did you notice any differences in, in how, um, how people talk just within that range? If, you know, if you had a cluster of people in seven, eight, nine years? And, you know. No. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I only had two participants with less than 10 years of experience, and one of those individuals was a, in a little more precarious position in terms of stability of the profession, right? So that participant's um, background was, was quite different from some of the most experienced. There, there was really a cluster there around 19, 20, 21, 22 years. Um, 
the variables that seem to make the most difference in terms of the quality of writing instructional practices was availability and taking advantage of on-campus writing centers and opportunities to teach writing intensive courses in English and in a couple of cases other types of professional development opportunities. Um, and that might come back to you know that finding on time. Um, quite a lot of my participants were in highly selective R1 institutions, private institutions, so I think um, rather than age or length of experience, it was availability of time and resources that supported um, more innovative pedagogies. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Heather. Thanks, Mandy. And thanks to all of you. Thank you.